All right, so let's go on with avascular necrosis of the shoulder, which touches on a little bit of what Bill was talking about with arthritis, but it's a different topic altogether. It is at times a, a subject of a question on the exam. And here's the question. A 37-year-old severe asthmatic has been taking daily corticosteroids for 20 years, so since 17 years old, and now reports four months of worsening left shoulder pain. He's unable to complete a full day of work due to the pain. The radiograph is provided in figure A. What, uh, which of the following describes the pathogenesis behind the disease process? So here's figure A. I think that's pretty straightforward. There's really nothing else in an adult that we would be concerned about. So when we look at the various questions that are here, um, a cell-mediated immune response with synovial hypertrophy, um, a humoral immune response, hyperuricemia, induced crystalline deposition within the synovial fluid, which of course is going to be throughout the joint, cellular death of the subchondral bone following an eruption in the vascular supply, and bacterial seeding of the joint, including polynuclear cell destruction. So these are all sort of more broad-based diseases. This is a very focal, isolated area at that superior medial corner, and this is classic uh, for avascular necrosis. So that's what the radiograph demonstrates. Um, the cellular death has occurred, um, and there's a collapse of the articular surface. There's a classification just like there is for the hip in this area. And um, they also, it, it's uh, not always suggested, but it's a good idea to check these patients. We actually wrote a paper on this that usually when a person comes to you with avascular necrosis, of the shoulder, they already had a vascular necrosis of the hip. In other words, the hip is usually affected first, and so many, many of the patients that come to you with the shoulder have already had hip problems that have been addressed. And if they haven't, it's a good idea to probably take some screening exams to make sure, especially when you know that number one cause of atraumatic avascular necrosis is the corticosteroids. So uh, again, these are just some good information to keep in mind based on the history that was provided to you. So it's caused by an interruption of the blood supply. There's a variety of different sort of underlying theories behind this, the de decreased blood supply, of course, or the absence of blood, and that can be for a variety. It was either stopped, uh, which happens, of course, with traumatic injuries, or some people believe there's a hypertension in there, which stops the nutrients, or some believe it's related to the lipids and the events that can go on to that area. But whatever it is, the blood supply doesn't get there, it doesn't get the nutrition, it doesn't get out of there, and because of that, the bone dies. And then after time, it will undergo some subchondral collapse, and that can be tolerated uh, pretty well, but once the architecture changes, that the overall outcome is not so good. Um, you remember this uh, is, a, the, again, the same as the hip. There's a mnemonic that's been used, aseptic, so alcohol and AIDS, um, steroids, which is the most common atraumatic cause, uh, sickle cell, uh, lupus, uh, Erlenmeyer flask, Gaucher's disease, pancreatitis, uh, usually probably related to, of course, the alcohol, trauma, idiopathic, and then at caissons or the bends, which uh, we don't see too much of that in the Midwest, but on the two coasts, you might see a little bit more of that. So just a little mnemonic to help you out with that. Uh, the pathophysiology, similar to the hip, it may be a traumatic, and more than 50% of the cases in the shoulder it is. It can be post-traumatic. So when you have a four-part or even a three-part fracture or even an anatomic neck two-part fracture, which is very rare, but when you have these, the risk of avascular necrosis is quite high, and uh, that's something that we share with our patients as soon as we see these things. So another question related to this, a 66-year-old male presents with a three-month history of increasing right shoulder pain, denies any trauma or prior shoulder problems, and has a good rotator cuff strength. His medical history is significant for Crohn's disease, which is controlled medically with prednisone therapy during flares. A current MRI image of his shoulder is shown in figure A. What most likely is the diagnosis? So we'll, we'll look at that. I'm just going to move this out of the way again so it's not distracting. And here it is here. So then we can take our little arrow. And this is what they're talking about, of course, is this little zone right through here. And that's the problem we're concerned about. And so when we look at our options, Gaucher's disease, osteoarthritis, rotator cuff, uh, tendinopathy, osteonecrosis, and calcific tendinitis. So that's a pretty straightforward one, osteonecrosis. And um, it goes along with the history that's provided to you. And then they go over some of the MRI findings uh, that you can see here. Decreased signal in the subchondral region, both T1 and T2, suggesting edema and early disease, not suggesting fat. And um, this is, uh, again, most commonly because of the use of corticosteroids in the shoulder. 
Um, <clears throat> here's some uh, another images. Here's an example of a more chronic one, and we've got collapse of the humerus uh, here, as you can see with the top image, uh, com complete collapse, and then you've got some bone spurs developing, and even then, unfortunately, it goes on to affect the glenoid, so this is a stage five, and so a total shoulder arthroplasty um, is the right treatment when it affects both the glenoid and the humerus in the management. Actually, there's some controversy that even in the earlier stages when it's symptomatic, whether we should do a total shoulder because a hemiarthroplasty in a patient with avascular necrosis typically does not have the same result as a total shoulder and osteoarthritis. So the condition itself is a challenging condition and some people elect to go to a total shoulder to try to eliminate all sources of pain. Now, what is the underlying uh, physiology uh, behind this? Uh, this has been very well studied, and you could be asked about these things. The humeral head is uh, basically um, provided a blood supply. The primary blood supply in an adult comes from the ascending branch of the anterior humeral circumflex. So you wonder sometimes in the surgeries when that's cut or ablated, why doesn't the head die? It's because there's an endosteal blood supply and there's some peripheral blood supply. But the posterior blood supply, which was there when they were a child, that basically involutes and it really comes from the front and then the endosteal region. And this vessel, uh, as you are well aware, runs anteriorly. It's part of the three sisters. And then the ascending branch runs up the groove uh, along the biceps tendon. So uh, that's where we see that. And that may be an important structure to avoid uh, when you're doing some open reduction internal fixation. Um, and then it goes into the arcuate artery, which is the interosseous continuation of this area. And as you see here, it provides 35% of the blood supply to the humeral head. The posterior humeral circumflex artery is, is not uh, always a, a big supply, but it, it does. You see here, some literature, the literature does support that it's a main supply to the humeral head uh, with about 65%. And that, this is kind of interesting how that comes around, but this has a lot to do with the fact when we have a fracture in that metaphyseal corner is displaced and how that can play a role in the prognosis with regards to the development of avascular necrosis after a fracture. Uh, this is a classification that's very commonly used. Uh, stage, stage zero is when you can't see it on x-ray, but it can be picked up on a sophisticated scan, scan like uh, MRI. Uh, this is, a, a, here's a, actually they're calling it stage one. Apologize for that. And then stage two, sclerosis, uh, as you see here. Uh, stage three, the crescent sign, which is where there's subchondral collapse underneath the articular cartilage. Four is the flattening of this area, and then five, as I mentioned before, is when it goes on to evolve both sides of the joint. And so here's just an example of that. It's a little bit of a uh, tricky image there, but that shows the stage two. Here's the stage three, where now the architecture has changed, and obviously this gets more and more difficult uh, for the patients to tolerate that when the geometry. And then this, of course, is stage four, but the overall glenoid is looking pretty good for the most part here. So we call that stage four. And then stage five, of course, when there's a collapse on both sides or both sides are affected, you have degenerative arthritis. This is an okay image. You probably would like to see a little more. There's just a little bit of arthritis starting down there. Uh, but that just gives you an idea of what you're looking for. Um, uh, because it happens very commonly with corticosteroids, there's often no clear traumatic event that occurs. The patients are, you'll have patients walk in and say, I just woke up one morning and my shoulder started hurting. It's never gotten better. And then they say it's very painful. They have loss of motion and the pain even occurs at rest, uh, which is a, a giveaway that it's something more serious. And of course, as it progresses, they have more limitations and more problems with uh, the discomfort and managing this. Uh, the radiographs, there's five views that you can get. Uh, we usually get a true AP and an axillary lateral, and then the other three views are going to be a scapular Y view, and they're also the internal and external rotation views of the humerus, which allows you to see the greater tuberosity and profile and the lesser tuberosity and profile. Most people get, to be honest with you, in clinical practice, just the three views, and then we'll supplement that with two additional views as needed based on what their concerns are. And then um, <clears throat> this is a... Uh, no findings on radiograph at the very onset of the disease, so it can be a little confusing, especially in our younger patients. 
uh, and then the most common site, and I think this is uh, by the blood supply. If you remember, uh, the blood supply is coming around uh, from the anterior circumflex and posterior circumflex vessels. You get that arcuate artery coming up here through the bicipital groove, and then somehow it gets uh, messed up in this, or the lateral ascending branch, and then the arcuate artery. And so this is the most common area that we see avascular necrosis. And um, that uh, kind of demonstrates just the beginning of that on this view here. And so now we'll move on to our, our next one. Uh, MRI, of course, is the, the best way to look at this in terms of detecting the condition. I still think it's very important to have good x-rays because that oftentimes dictates the, the treatment. And you can see it on MRI, but uh, the x-rays are also very helpful. But certainly you know that this involves a big part of the humeral head is much more extensive, and the glenoid side is not as badly affected in this situation. Non-operative management is symptomatic. It's a first line of treatment. Uh, these patients can go a long time, even with articular incongruity, and so there's not a rush to get in there. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. There are some things uh, that can be done, like a core decompression, which will help for pain relief, but not necessarily in the shoulders recognized to really improve radiographic findings or things along those lines. So uh, we treat them very conservatively for as long as they can tolerate. So this question, 45-year-old man complains of chronic right shoulder pain. He's had a history of the um, of a chronic steroid use because of his asthma. He recently completed a course of physical therapy and has given up his job as a laborer in favor of a desk job. Exam reveals diminished shoulder abduction strength. The radiograph of his shoulder is shown below in figure A, so let's take a look at that. There's figure A, so we see the radiograph here, and it's a little suspicious for what's going on right in this corner right here as we see. The rest of it looks pretty good uh, with regards to this view. And so we'll go back to read the rest of the question. Which of the following surgical treatment options, figures B through F, is the most appropriate? And so uh, we'll go with figure B. So figure B is going to be a core decompression. Figure C is going to be a hemiarthroplasty. Figure D is going to be a reverse. Figure E is going to be a, a, a resurfacing, as you see here. And just a minor comment, this is way overstuffed. Uh, the humeral head should be literally way back here. So this is at least a centimeter and a half overstuffed. So um, even if this was the right answer, that technically is not a good looking x-ray. And then the last one is a total shoulder with a, um, with a metal backed uh, glenoid component. And so the answer here, when we go through this, thinking about it, which one's the right answer? Figure B, and this is what they're recommending. So going back to the images, they're suggesting that because of the fact there's no collapse and the patient has a lot of pain and they have a focal site, that one of the ways to help this patient is to do a core decompression. And that's what this is in this drawing right here. And you have to be very careful when you do this. You have to identify the level where the axillary nerve is at. And also, this area is usually posterior and slightly superior. So the targeting site is usually right off the edge of the biceps. And you'll do this under fluoro to find this. And typically, what we do is we'll go in and make a small hole in the cortex and then go in and do a punch biopsies, two or three, which accomplishes the core decompression, but also uh, gets your biopsies so you have the correct diagnosis in this area. And we certainly want to avoid penetrating through the articular cartilage when we do that. So core decompression is indicated. Uh, the pre-collapse stages one and two may be treated in this method. It's good for pain relief. I don't think it's been well proven that it actually changes the long-term natural history. And then hemiarthroplasty is suggested for three and four. Again, a little controversy, but that's probably the standard answer. And then five, of course, is total shoulder arthroplasty uh, for the treatment of avascular necrosis. And, um, uh, some people do use arthroscopy. That's a, a little bit of a, a, a newer concept, uh, especially if there's a little collapse. They'll use it to debride a flap or clear out the glenohumeral joint if there's something going on. If it's really a true stage one or stage two and the cartilage is intact, then straight core decompression has been uh, what most people have done in this setting. And then, of course, at stage three, you need to do something for the humeral head. Um, and then we can either do a hemiarthroplasty, or if it's advanced when it's both sides, we do a total shoulder arthroplasty, as we've been covering.
If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.